Welcome back again to the Bulletproof Handyman Business Channel. Uh, I'm trying to bang these out today. I've had a whole bunch of them written down and I have a little bit of time. So now we're going into top 10 business skills for running a handyman business. These are not your manual labor skills. These are not your job skills. These are business skills that are the top 10 that are going to make sure you succeed. And I'm going to start at number 10, work my way down to number 1. I don't have a whole lot of extra time, so we're going to jump right in. Number 10, service and grooming, tenant facing. So your service and your grooming, I hate that I have to throw grooming in there, but honestly I do have to. But the idea is the perception that you're giving the tenants when you show up at their place. Now this is number 10 for a reason. Because honestly, this is important. This is It's going to be crucial that you do master this. However, of all the skills, uh, you, you are going to need to learn to view tenants not as if they're not important. You do need to view them as if they're important. However, of all the things you need to be worried about, if you show up at their house basically clean and get the job done without causing any problems, you're mostly going to be all right. But... If you can impress a tenant, or if you can at the very least not impress them, but just have them feeling very comfortable and satisfied and happy that you knocked on their door and that you did the work that needed to get done, that is going to make its way back to the property managers, and that is going to play into their future decision making on who to send to which job. So just know... You need to be groomed. You need to provide good service. I don't think I need to go into detail on what that is. Just imagine what you would like, who you would like to show up at your front door, how you would prefer that they behave, and be that. Number nine, planning and thoroughness. Now, number nine and on are very important. Every single thing from number nine and on can make or break your business. So, planning and thoroughness. Now, I'm specifically referring to planning for your day in advance, as well as when you're doing your scheduling, planning out your week and your next couple weeks in advance. So as far as planning out your day, the reason that matters is you might have four or five jobs scheduled. You've got some amount of inventory. You've got whatever tools you've got. What you need to be doing is you need to be going in your head. You need to be going over these jobs. You need to be visualizing, like, what do I need to do? What do I always do on these? What materials do I need? What can go wrong? And what am I, what am I going to need if that does go wrong? It involves getting the tenant to send you some pictures and it all, in advance. And it also involves talking to the tenant on the phone, if possible, and getting them to just describe things to you. The more you can get a tenant to talk, the better you're going to be. And the reason for that is, is they often use incorrect nomenclature. They often don't understand what's going on. You know, the most basic example is somebody will say something shorted. Well, they don't know that it's shorted. Shorted means that your power is attached to your ground, and there's no load in between, and all the power is going straight from the source to the ground. A short goes away because of a circuit breaker. A short can be something that happens that pops the breaker, and sometimes that's the cause. But the bottom line is when a tenant says something shorted, that doesn't mean it's shorted. That means something electrical isn't working, and they use the word shorted. They're going to use lots of words that don't mean what you think they mean. They're even going to call like a bifold door. They'll call a slider door. You know what I mean? So make sure you try to talk to them, get some pictures if you can. Know in advance what all the possibilities for the day are going to be. And if you can, show up. Before you ever start your day, before you get to your first job, show up at your first job with everything that you could possibly need for the entire day. And sometimes that means buying some materials you may not need and you may not use. That's fine. Put them into inventory. Return them if you want to, but I put all mine into inventory because I'll need them someday. And make sure, like I said, when you show up to that first job, be prepared by that point in time for all your jobs for the whole day. This is going to save you Home Depot trips. This is going to make your day shorter. It's going to make your day smoother. And it's going to prevent you from having to cancel your last job or two of the day because the other ones ran over because you weren't prepared. So be very thorough. Be very prepared. It will make all the difference. And the more you get into this habit, the faster and better you're going to be. And your property managers are going to notice that you're just kicking ass like all the time. And they're going to want to send you more work. Number eight. Again, all of these after number 10 are very crucial. Numbers. 
you need to know your numbers. You really do. You need to know, on average, how much gas do I use per day? On average, how much of this do I go through per day? You need to know what your hourly rates are. You need to be timing yourself when you do these jobs. If you change a garbage disposal, time yourself every single time. See that you're getting faster. Look for ways to improve. Know what all of your incoming and outgoing expenses are. Um, you really you need to have an intimate knowledge of your numbers because if you don't, all you know at the end of the day is I seem to be usually broke or I seem to usually have money, but you don't know why. And if you don't know why, you can't improve on the things that are costing you and you can't further improve or double down on the things that are gaining for you. So know your numbers in and out every single side. I'd even suggest, honestly, go watch Shark Tank. The sharks on Shark Tank understand what numbers are important before they invest. And typically, the business owners on Shark Tank know that they need to know those numbers. And they go in there with those numbers in their head. And if you watch enough of those episodes, you start realizing like, oh, these, yeah, these numbers directly relate to success. So know your numbers. Number seven is organization. Uh, and that includes your business and your work vehicle and all of your tools and stuff. But organization, you need to be organized. I'm going to give you an example with your, your truck or your van and all of your tools. If you don't know where one thing is at, and you have to climb through and search through all your boxes and all your bins and try to figure out if you don't even know if you have it especially, but that's an easy, easily, easily five minutes. And if you have to do that three times per job, that's 15 minutes per job. If you have to do that for three jobs out of the day, 45 minutes. You're costing yourself almost an hour. You're costing yourself 75 bucks a day by having to just go look for stuff because you're not organized. And then the same thing with your business. Even more so, you need to be organized. And that means you need to know... You need to know what jobs you have on the books. You need to know what jobs have been completed, what jobs haven't been completed. Have a general idea of when everything is scheduled. You need to know kind of off the top of your head all the parts that you've ordered, all the parts you still need to order, inventory that you need to replace, maintenance that needs to be done to your vehicle. You should be, a, you should be on top of all of that stuff all the time. And all that really takes usually is just thinking about it. It's just instead of getting into like whatever dreamy thing, and trust me guys, I know, I have so many passions in life, there's so many things that I'm obsessed with, I want to listen to all my podcasts, I want to listen to a bunch of audio books, I'm thinking on just world events and possibilities and my family and my future, but you need to take your work day and you need to devote it to being a business owner and to knowing everything in your business and to keeping all of that stuff organized. Have some spreadsheets that you keep track of a lot of things with if you need to. Know your inventory levels. Stay organized. If you're disorganized, you're just going to spend half your day running around trying to find things and trying to figure out things that you could have already known had you taken the few minutes it took beforehand to get it all put together in a way that makes sense for you. <coughs> Next, uh, scheduling should be realistic, and it should be simple to complex, and I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. So we're talking about mostly for the day. You're scheduling for the day. However, this does also apply to scheduling out a week or two in advance. When you're doing your scheduling for each individual day, what you want to do is try to be in one area of town, unless it's a smaller town and it's all one area, but in a bigger place, try to do the northeast side one day and the southwest side the other day and a central location on this day and start getting those blocked together when you do your scheduling. This is going to minimize your drive time all around town. It's going to make it easier to pick up all your materials at one place. Uh, and also uh, organi no, scheduling in terms of simple to complex. So let's say you have, this is a good one. Somebody says, my ceiling fan, the, the fan blades are working, but the light's not turning on. That could be a light bulb, so that might be a one-minute job. Or that could be taking the ceiling fan down and removing the remote control receiver that's inside the fan and reprogramming it or even going to Home Depot, picking up another receiver if you weren't organized and you didn't bring one because you didn't plan going and getting another receiver and getting it put in, getting the whole ceiling fan back up. So how much time do you schedule for this job? Is that one minute that you schedule, or do you schedule two hours? You need to put that at the end of the day. Now let's say you have a garbage disposal 
that that isn't working. That's all you know. It's just not working. Garbage disposal not working. Put that at the beginning of the day because a garbage disposal, worst case scenario, once you get good at swapping them out, that's 30 minutes. Even if you're not good at it, your first one is probably not going to take you more than an hour. But once you do a few, you're going to know that it's going to take you, say, 30 to 45 minutes to swap one. So you set your first appointment for the day for arrival between 9 and 10 a.m. And I say 9 and 10 because typically before 9, people don't really want other people in their house. That's part of the morning routine. They're getting kids ready for school or the husband or the wife is getting ready and heading to school. You're not quite awake yet. Um, so I usually say I'll arrive between 9 and 10 a.m. And then I make sure I arrive at 9 for that first one. However, if I take extra time at Home Depot because I can't find something or maybe they're out of stock and I've got to drive to another Home Depot or an Ace Hardware, that window gives me that buffer. But the point is I've put a job at the beginning of the day that I know how long it's going to take me, even worst case scenario. And then your second job of the day should similarly be a job that you know how long it's going to take you or close to how long it's going to take you. And then by the end of the day, say you're 3 o'clock, I typically don't schedule anything after 3 because it's going to be a 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. arrival, which means to schedule after that, I'd be scheduling after 4. That job could take 2 hours. I'm not done till 6. I'm not home till 6.30. I don't get to see my family because i got to come in voice and stuff. So I try to schedule my last jobs beginning no later than 3. So schedule the jobs that you're very good at, that you know how long it's going to take you, even in a worst case scenario at the beginning, and progressively through the day, schedule up to the jobs that are more up in the air how long it's going to take you. Next, <clears throat> saying no. Saying no and tone setting, both related to each other. When you say no... A lot of y'all are going to be scared to say no, I guess is what I'm trying to say. A lot of y'all, when you say no, you're thinking that you're going to make somebody upset. You're worried that you're going to lose jobs. And you need to know when to say no and why to say no. But you do have to learn to say no. And I'm going to give you some examples when, when I say no. Number one, I say no to homeowners over and over and over and over again. I don't work for them. I don't want to work for them. I don't need to work for them. They're not the easiest clients. Sometimes they are higher paying clients, but I'm looking for stability, uniformity over time. I'm looking to build a business that runs on a system and a process that can be slowly built up into something that really matters many years into the future rather than trying to make as much money as I can today. So I say no to homeowners all the time. And it is kind of hard because part of you in the back of your mind goes, what if I need that money? What if I need that job? Just learn how to say no. You need to figure out in advance what you are and aren't willing to do. You need to have company policies. And when people ask you to do things outside those company policies, you have to say no. Another example is if I'm asked to work inside a home that has tenants living there, but they want me to go inside the home and do the work when the tenants aren't there. Now, I'm not saying you can't go inside the home and work when the tenants aren't there. You have to decide that policy for yourself. But I know too many people, personally, not tenants, I know people who are of the type that if a handyman was in their home on Saturday and on Tuesday they notice that their necklace is missing, they're going to assume the handyman might have taken their necklace if he was there when they weren't there. This has happened to me one time I was accused of stealing either a video game or a video game controller. Now guys, I didn't grow up without video games. I'm Generation X. I'm 42 years old. So for me, Nintendo, like the first Nintendo, I don't count Atari and stuff because when I was a kid, Atari was not a video game. That was a piece of technology that only adults owned and only adults were allowed to touch with very few exceptions. But the whole video game thing didn't happen until I was already in junior high. So I'm not addicted to them. You know, I played them a little bit. I enjoyed them here and there. But I'm, I'm not like the Halo generation. I don't own a video game set. My boy, my seven-year-old, has video games. And I don't play them with him. I think he's convinced me to do a little Mario Kart here and there. And even... I just don't have time. I'm, I'm one of those people. I have enough hobbies. I have enough passions. And I don't have enough time to put into the things that I already love. I have nothing to do with video games. But I was accused of stealing either a game or a controller. I can't remember which anymore because it was a couple years ago. But from that moment on, my policy is I don't work inside a home that's occupied. 
unless there is an adult who resides in that home there. Or, like, if somebody sends their brother or their dad or something, I guess they don't have to reside there. But there needs to be a grown, responsible adult there while I'm working there. Uh, that means not a 13-year-old girl, not a 16-year-old boy, no combination thereof. I don't care if there's 17 year, 17, 17 year old boys, one every five feet, keeping an eye on everything. If they're not 18 years old, and they're not somehow responsible for that place, then I'm not going to be there working because I don't want any miscommunications and I don't want anybody assuming that I broke anything, stole anything, or in any way, shape, and form did anything inappropriate while I'm there. So I've learned to say no. You need to figure out your policies. Another example for mine is going to be I don't do free estimates for piddly jobs. I used to never do free estimates. Now I do them for bigger jobs, only for property managers that I have some history with that I know aren't going to be wasting my time. But I don't do free estimates for little jobs. I charge $125 if somebody wants an estimate for like a $300 job. I do free estimates for like $800 jobs. So just figure out how to say no. You'll be respected, I promise you. They're, if they do get mad that you say no, they're looking for an employee, not a vendor to send work to. So just figure out how to say no. Do it confidently. You know, don't make it a big deal. Don't apologize over and over. You can say I'm sorry, but just say I'm sorry, but unfortunately, I can't do that. And that sets the tone for your future relationship with them. They know what you will do. They know what you won't do. But more importantly, they know that whatever your policies are and have been, that you do enforce them and that it's not worth their time to ask you to break them. Next, number four, client-facing perceptions. This is a little bit similar to the say no thing with tone setting. But when I say client-facing perceptions, what I mean is when you first get on with a client, right off the bat, from the very first day, the very first conversation, how you hold yourself, how you present yourself, how you speak, the amount of eye contact you make, the amount of fidgeting you do, the amount of um, um, ah, uh, eh, eh, I don't know, all of that, the lack of confidence, all of those things are getting cemented in from the very first minute. I want you to put yourself in the mind of a property manager. I want you to put yourself in the mind of somebody who works in an office. They need to hire a lot of vendors to do a lot of work on a lot of places. They're constantly having issues with vendors in terms of just not doing a good job, not showing up, overcharging, just dropping the ball, any number of things go wrong. They're always having to go find new vendors for new things. So you come along and you're a handyman. Now, it's so easy to want people to like you, but you don't need them to like you, not on a personal level. Put yourself in their shoes and imagine that a vendor, say you're going to meet them in person, right? You're the property manager, and this vendor is going to come into the office to introduce himself and give you some paperwork. When he comes in, what are you more comfortable with? Somebody who's really friendly with a nice smile on their face but doesn't have a lot of confidence and is a little meek and can't quite answer all of your questions but promises he's going to do a good job for you, seems really eager and desperate to get the work. How are you going to view him? You're probably going to utilize him. If he doesn't seem like a hack... They're going to say yes to almost everybody when they need somebody. But you're going to view that guy now as something like an employee because he's made it clear that he's eager to please and he doesn't have a lot of confidence. <sighs> he comes off to you as more of a person rather than a business. And people can be manipulated. People can be used. People can be abused. People can be convinced of a lot of things. Now I want you to imagine you're that same property manager and a handyman shows up and when he walks in, he's got a button-down shirt, it's tucked in, there's a belt on, his jeans are clean, his shirt is clean and not wrinkled, he's wearing boots, he's got a tape measure on his hip, he's got a clipboard, he's got a hat or his hair is done well, he's relatively groomed, he's looking the way that obviously he wants to be perceived and he comes in and he doesn't appear eager. And he shakes your hand and he looks you in the eye and he behaves throughout that meeting as if he is a provider of a service and he's offering you, he's not asking you for permission to work on stuff. 
He's offering you the opportunity to work with him. He's just laying out what his business is, how it works, what he does, what he charges, what you can expect from him, what he expects from you. You can tell your property managers what you need in a company that you do work for. That guy is also going to get work, but the difference is that guy is going to be treated with respect. That guy is going to get texted. Imagine these two scenarios. You're the property manager, and some, you have an emergency. It's 6 p.m., so it's not like after dark or anything. Most people are still awake, and you've got some handymen, and you've got an emergency. The emergency is a tenant called and said, hey, we just lost power like in the back part of our home. It's the, bed, it's the two bedrooms at the end of the hallway and the bath right next to them. None of them have any power. She needs to send somebody out to get that fixed right away. And let's say she assumes that both you, the confident guy with a button-down shirt and a belt and clean clothes who had a clipboard and who spoke to her as if he was offering her the opportunity to work with him, let's say you call that guy. How are you going to speak to him? You're probably going to ask him nicely if he's willing to please go do this for you. Now let's say you're that same property manager and you're calling the guy who is eager. You might say something like, I need you to go blah blah blah. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. This has to be done this way. This has to be done that way. There's a difference. There's a world of difference in how they're going to treat everybody. In fact, my first property manager... <clears throat> Her name was Michelle, and my very first property manager, very small company, not a whole lot of work. She was the one that got me into property management. I was astounded at how much money I could charge, and she didn't blink. And now that doesn't even seem like great money, but at the time it did. But my history with her ended up such that maybe it was six months in. Um, it's hard to remember the exact circumstances, but... She called me at some point and told me that she needed me to do something. Like she needed me to go to a house tomorrow and meet her to do something. And I was like, and we had, we were like somewhat friendly. It was still a professional sort of rapport. But I mean, we could joke around here and there because her boss required her to go to the property when the handyman was working there for a while. And then there was a time finally when her boss calmed down and was like, okay, we've been using this guy a while. I guess he's not going to like steal stuff or mess anything up. But in that period of time, you know, we became somewhat friendly so that we could joke around. And she said, I need you to meet me here tomorrow at like three o'clock so we can, I think it was just hanging some pictures. It was something stupid simple. And I was like, you need me to, or you're asking me to? And she kind of laughed and she was like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, can you please meet me there, please? I really would appreciate it. I could use your help. And I smiled, and I was like, yeah, it's no problem. Of course, I'll meet you there tomorrow at 3. I'll have to move a job back by like 30 minutes, but I can take care of that. It's no big deal. And then she laughed, and she was like, you know the last handyman I had? He was so eager. I could just tell him to do anything. I she straight out told me this, that she would, that she understood that with him... She could tell him what to do, and he would do it. She treated him like an employee, and she even verbalized that to me, that she was very aware that with me, I'm me, and I do things the way I do things, and that she has to work within my system. I never told her that. And you shouldn't speak to property managers with that tone, like, you have to work within my system. But she was just aware that I had a system, and that I didn't seem to veer outside of the system unless there was a true emergency. But long story short is... The way that they perceive you is going to be based on how you interact with them from day one. They're going to appreciate and be comforted by somebody who's strong and confident, who comes in offering a service rather than begging for the opportunity to do some work. <clears throat> I think I may have gone on a little too long about that, but I've noticed it's made a difference with my business. Next... Communication needs to be clear, it needs to be accurate, and it needs to be fast. Communication, we're getting into the really big ones now. These are the ones, communication, I don't have it as number one because I had to make some choices, but this one, I'm telling you, I do a good job of it because it's my policy. Not because I'm better at it than anybody. Anybody can choose to communicate effectively. Most people just don't choose to. 
but I communicate effectively and I communicate a lot and my property managers appreciate it. And another thing I do is I'm picky about what I communicate and when I communicate it. I make sure they get all of the information they need. I also make sure they don't get any information that they don't need. They don't have time to sit around and listen to you talk and drone on about all the details of the work you did for them. They want to know what the problem was, what the fix was, is it solid, is it good to go, good, where's my invoice so I can pay you. That's what they want. This also involves things like letting them know up front, especially before you do work, that there are certain things entailed in this work that could veer in a certain direction and that you can't predict in advance where it's going to go and let them know in advance, hey, by the way, sometimes I find this when I work on this. If I find this, it's going to result in me needing to do this, which is going to cost an extra $200, and I just need you to know that in advance because if I can get approval in advance for that, if it happens, if I have the approval already in place, I can keep working and continue. If I don't have it in place, I'm going to have to reach out for approval, and if I don't receive that approval, if you don't happen to hear your phone ringing and I don't get the approval, I'm going to have to stop working, leave everything just the way it is, charge for that trip, and then charge for the next trip when I go back to finish up after I get the approval. That's all part of the communication. Another part of the communication, say with paint matching, there are certain types and shades of paint that are almost impossible to match. You can let them know in advance if you see that. You could say, hey, by the way, this whole house is painted with a flat paint. Flat paints absorb smoke, moisture, oils, everything, dust, dirt. It's like a sponge for the air, and it means that it's going to not it's going to be impossible to get one color of paint that's going to match all the walls. It's going to be too light on the dirty spots. It's going to be too dark on the cleaner spots. It's going to be impossible to match. You want to figure out what they need to know, what they don't need to know. Another part of communication is, for example, one company that sends me work orders electronically. When they send them, I have to click Accept. That's a form of communication, clicking that Accept button. So when I receive it, I make sure to click accept right away because they get a notification that says I accepted the job. And that's me communicating to them I'm on top of things. And then within 24 hours, I contact the tenant, and you, you need to communicate with tenants as well. I contact the tenant, and I either schedule them or I at least tell them when they can expect a phone call for scheduling. But I contact the tenant right away. That's communication. I try to get them scheduled on that same call. And if and when I do get them scheduled right away, I go back to that software and I send the message to the property manager to let them know this is scheduled and when it's scheduled. Always communication. You want to always answer your phone. Don't be the guy that when your phone rings at 9 o'clock at night and it's a property manager, you know that's probably an emergency job. And you probably don't feel like doing it, especially if you're doing well in your business and your bank account looks fine. You don't want to jump up at 9 o'clock at night and go work on something so you don't answer your phone and you think, oh, tomorrow morning I'll text him and say, hey, I saw a missed call from you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, man, if I'd have known, I'd have answered, and, you know, I just didn't even know and I'd have done that job for you. They're not stupid. When they have emergencies, especially late at night, nobody answers their phone. I know they don't because when I get called, I'm always told, thank God, because nobody else is answering their phone because they don't want to do this job. They know, you know, you know they know, they know, you know they know, everybody knows. It's not a secret. Answer your phone every time. Now, if you're on top of a ladder stretched up to the ceiling changing a light bulb, I'm not saying stop and jump off the ladder and answer right away, but get that light bulb in, get to the bottom of the ladder, check your phone, and if it was a property manager, call them back immediately. They appreciate that, guys. I, f I want to put this as number one almost. It's just, it's unfortunately not, but this the, the top three, you might as well call them all tied for number one. Communication will cement you in because the other guys are not communicating. If you're making a huge effort to be great at it, the other guys are not, and it does matter. Next, no hacks. No hacks. This is your job. The work that you do, don't hack it. Trust me, a year into this, you're going to know of a lot of hacks because you're going to go behind a lot of other handymen who hacked, and you're going to see how they hacked. 
you're going to figure out your own hacks. It's going to become very obvious that there are ways you could make things work where when you walk out the door and go home and send that invoice, at that moment it's going to work, but there are also ways in which you know it's not going to continue working. You're going to know, and you're going to be in these positions where if you're doing business the way I'm telling you to do it, the faster you are, the more money you make. So you're going to have this urge sometimes to go, ah, I could do this, and I could just be out of here like that, and I could charge 165 bucks for 20 minutes of work. And yeah, it might come back, but it might not come back. And if it does come back, it might be some time, and maybe they won't remember, and I'll have an excuse I can give for it, or I can say, no, 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 I did the other one, not that one. Don't hack things, guys. When you're in that moment, when you know that there's a hack you could do, and you have to make that choice, make the choice to do the job right. I'm just, just do it, guys. Just make the choice to do the job right. The result is going to be this. Now, if you look back over my business overall, how many callbacks my business has gotten, it's been more than I like. Probably not as many as most, but still more than I like because I've hired other people to do work for me who have gone and hacked things. And I've also fired every one of them. Every one of them. I've hired and fired... Well, I don't hire because I contract work out, but I bring on a new guy. I bring them in. I send them a bunch of work. They hack things. I fire them. First time. If you're a cheater and a liar, you're always going to be a cheater and a liar. People don't change. I'll go into that on Twitter, maybe, where I do more of my personal beliefs about the world. But I believe people don't change. And somebody who's willing to lie to you, say they did a job correctly when they know they didn't, and you can see, you can look and you can know. You can say... I know how this goes because I've done this job. For him to have done that, I know what he was seeing and I know what he was thinking and I know what he did. I've hired 12 and I've fired 12. So right now, I guess I've hired 14 and I've fired 12. Right now I've got two guys that are doing some work for me, not a lot. I'm trying to not encourage more work from my property managers because I'm trying to stay very focused on this YouTube thing, Jobber is sponsoring me enough that I can take some time to do this for y'all, and it's what I enjoy doing, so I'm not even trying to find new work right now or hire new guys, but don't hack stuff. The end result is going to be, if you don't hack stuff, you're going to be like me. For my work that I touched with my hands, I get maybe two callbacks a year. Both of them are typically things that are not even my fault. It's a materials failure. Like the last one, which was the first one in maybe eight months, was a sliding door handle that I installed new eight months ago that just a couple weeks ago I went to go look at. When I got there, what I found was it was a materials failure in the sliding door handle itself. It wasn't anything I did. But let me tell you what I did. I put on a new sliding door handle, a brand new one, Got it all rigged up just right. It locks beautifully. I also cleaned and, and uh, siliconed the tracks so that it slides nice and smooth. Tightened everything up real nice. Made sure the tenant was extremely happy and had them test the door. Was super friendly. And then I let the property manager know that I felt that it was a materials failure and not my fault. And I said, however, because I worked on this and you paid me for a good sliding door handle, whether it's materials failure or my fault, doesn't matter. I'm taking care of this for free, no charge. So what did that cost me? 50 bucks for a sliding door handle, an hour of my time. And not only did I not lose money, but in fact what I gained was more loyalty because I just showed that property manager that she can trust me when I say if my work's bad I'm gonna go back and fix it for free number one she can see that my work's never bad and now number two she can see that on the very rare occasion I'm not gonna give her a hard time she can call me and say hey a thing you worked on is not working well right now and she can rest assured because of her experience with me having been there and done that on this sliding door handle she knows that I'm gonna go back and I'm always gonna take care of if they pay me for something they're gonna get what they paid for very important guys very important and finally number one this is a hard one follow through follow through follow through maybe for some of y'all this isn't hard I can tell you for me it is because I'm somebody who has a lot of confidence in myself I make a lot of plans, I make a lot of promises, I have a lot of dreams, I like to talk to people about my plans, and I like to have 
my policies and procedures that I communicate to the property managers and I say, hey, when you send me this, you're going to get this. When you ask this, you're going to get this. When you request that, you're going to get that. To the extent that you make those promises, you need to follow through. This also applies to deadlines. A deadline's not necessarily a promise, but if they send you a work order for a move out and they say, we need this invoiced by July 26th, by you accepting that work order, maybe you didn't say, I'll have this done by July 26th, but by accepting that work order, you've made a promise to follow through on the work order, and part of that work order is also the deadline. But you've got to follow through, guys. If you say, hey, when you send me a job, I'm going to contact the tenants within 24 hours, you need to follow through. You need to actually do it. If you're not going to do it, don't say it. Because what's going to happen is maybe the first 12 tenants that you don't contact for 48 hours, they're probably not going to say anything. They're not used to getting good service, so they're not surprised when two days goes by. But eventually what you're going to have is a tenant's going to call the property manager and say, hey, I asked for this work to get done four days ago, and I haven't heard from anybody. They're mad at the property manager. Not you, they're mad at the property manager, because all they know is they asked for something to get fixed, and they haven't heard anything. Well, that's because the property manager took a day or two to send you the work order. When they send you the work order, it took a half a day for you to notice it and click the accept button and get it in your software. And then you had to get home that evening and maybe a bunch of stuff was going on. Maybe you were really tired. Maybe it was a bad day. Any number of things could have happened. You need to contact those tenants, even if that means it's 8 o'clock at night and you just shoot them a quick text and say, hey, by the way, this is so-and-so with such-and-such company. I just want you to know we received your work order and we're going to be contacting you shortly to schedule. That's all you got to say. You could even have like a generic message. I don't. I want it to feel personal. I want them to know that I am communicating with them. But you could even have a generic message that you just shoot out to every single one, just at the very least so that you can have contacted them so they know you're on the job and they're not contacting a property manager and telling the property manager they haven't heard from you yet after you told that property manager that you always contact everybody within 24 hours. This applies to everything. It applies to every policy, it applies to every procedure, it applies to every detail of your business. If you say you're going to do something, whether it's to a tenant or to a property manager, if you say you're going to do something, you must follow through. If you get a reputation of somebody who says, hey, I'm going to invoice that tonight, I got that done yesterday, sorry I forgot to invoice, I know you need the invoice, I'll get it to you tonight, don't get it to them at 6 a.m. the next morning. That might still work, but they're going to see that you're not following through. And no, you're not going to necessarily lose them because of minor things like that. But over time, if you're constantly making promises you don't follow through on, they're going to stop believing what you tell them. And once they don't believe what you tell them, if they have somebody else, that somebody else should be you. You need to be the guy that is the somebody else. They're going to say, hey, you know what? This guy always does what he says he's going to do. Be that guy and follow through. I really hope this was useful, guys. These are on here for a reason. This is coming from maybe just a few years of experience specifically working as a handyman for property management companies, but this is also a lifetime experience of business. I used to own a food truck. I've done a lot of things. <clears throat> I was a field service engineer for drones in Afghanistan, but I'm very familiar with providing services and figuring out how to get loyal people whom you're providing those services to. And this all applies 100%. Please take it to heart. Please do everything you can to practice it. And I want to remind you all, now that we're at the end, you can turn the video off if you want. But if you go to the job, if you go to the description for this video, there's a free, <clears throat> there's a link to your free trial for Jobber. Jobber's how I run my whole business. I have an Amazon store there. I also have a link to Twitter. And on Twitter is where I'm going to go into more of my personal morals and values and ethics. <clears throat> things that I think have, have extremely contributed to my success, but that I don't want to bring up on this channel too much because this is a business channel. 
So we're going to get more into stuff like that over there. I'm also going to share more personal projects and more stuff from my personal life. I want to interact with y'all more on a friendly basis, and I want to keep YouTube just the place to go for how to do this dang business. So I appreciate y'all tuning in, especially if you stay it all the way to the end. Please like, share, comment, do all those things, engage with me. Helps the channel grow. The quicker the channel grows, the quicker I can get maybe a couple more sponsors. I can get more reimbursement for my time, which means the quicker I can do more of these videos and get y'all more information and turn this channel into something truly amazing with a community of handymen who are really providing for their families out there. So I love you guys. I hope you're all out there killing it. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.